Just to clear the record, the reason we say numerous grandchildren on there is that we can't keep track of the, how often that's published. It is now 18 going on 21. <laughs> so we don't like to redo the copy as often as we make the changes. I'm already looking forward to the choir's next number because it's after my remarks are completed, but I must tell them how much I enjoyed the first one. I couldn't have asked for a number that I would have enjoyed more. You see, I collect mountains. I treasure them. I think it began by being raised at the foot of Timpanogos on the Wasatch side. That's the way you see the Sleeping Princess, you Utah County people realize that. But I love that mountain, and everywhere I've gone, I've found a mountain to love. We lived in Salt Lake by Twin Peaks, and in Preston, Idaho, by a little mountain that of no reason, it just sprang up in the middle of a valley. Now we look out of our dining room and kitchen window to Ben Lomond. Ben Lomond, I understand, was the prototype used by Paramount for their logo, and it is a beautiful mountain. Now let me tell you why I love them so. Because they build my self-esteem ever since I came across a little poem by Helen Lowry Marshall in The Gift of Wonder. She says, I looked upon a mountain high in grandeur, rising to the sky, and then I contemplated me, how very small I seemed to be. Yet, in this fragile frame of mine, God chose to house a soul divine, not in that glorious sun-crowned peak, but in this body frail and weak. God chose to give to you and me the promise of eternity, a child of His, can such be small? A soul is surely heaven tall. No, the mountain stands that I might see. How greater is the soul of me. Will you think of that every time you go outside these buildings here on this beautiful campus, ringed with these wonderful mountains, and think how much more worth you are than that gorgeous sight? Well, I look about you, and you look like a convention of the teenagers that have graced our home while we've been raising those eight children, sharing with us gallons, hundreds of gallons of ice cream and great barrels of caramel pop popcorn. I understand that it's spring break here now, but this looks like one of those crowds that had come through on a Saturday night. And on one occasion, when I was downtown, I called home and I asked for each of my children in turn when a young man answered the phone, and he said, no, none of them are here right now. And I said, oh, who is this? And he said, oh, this is Brent. Oh, what are you doing, Brent? Well, Bill and I are just sitting here having some chocolate ice cream and watching television. <laughs> it's always open house at our place, and they know it. And I thanked him kindly and said, keep taking the messages, and if anyone needs me, I'll be home soon. So <laughs> I've been trying to tell myself that you're just like those kids that I've just laughed with and loved over the years, and that I didn't really need to agonize like I've been doing it to talk to you. But you see, I realize now that you're older and you're wiser and that most of you are students at this great university where you enter to learn and go forth to serve. You advertise that the world is your campus, and I know that to be true. Wherever we have gone, and you see the Mormons meeting and greeting, someone's bound to say, rise and shout, the cougars are out. Or did you hear about the BYU game? Or you ask couples where they met, and they were students together at BYU, and you know what a successful job that the BYU is doing. <laughs> and they're sending them out to serve, and what a great and wonderful contribution they're making everywhere in the world. So I thought very carefully about what it is I should say to you that would help you to be more prepared for your present and your future responsibilities. And my message is very simple. It's love the Lord. You know, in Corinthians it says, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor even 
entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those that love him. Be among those that love him. I just hope and pray that all those happy surprises promised for the obedient will be yours at the end of your road. And I know that it's happening. I want you to know that there's a generation of young people rising that are sending down tendrils of testimony that are growing strong and taking root. And all over the world we see them. And we know that the future is in good hands, but you must realize how few you are compared to the world and how very needed every one of you is in spreading this marvelous gospel. Now that's what I want you to appreciate, is the great miracle it is that we have the knowledge that is ours to have today. It isn't just happenstance. You know, you look at the stories. I wish I had time to go into all of them, but Mormon, we feast at a table, you know, that we didn't even help to prepare. Take his story, for example. Ten years old when he was given his first assignment. All the time he was doing his labors of abridging the records, he knew that it wasn't for his people. He knew they wouldn't listen. They had proven it to him so many times that he gave up directing them as leader of the army and then went back repentant to help him again. He knew it wasn't for them that he labored. He saw us down the corridors of time and did all that he did, gave his life that we might have this great knowledge. Then his son Moroni, who wandered in the world alone for 20 years, to finish the record, to secure it, to put it in the hill, to put it in the stone box, and then add to that miracle the labors and the life of Joseph Smith, who finally 1,400 years later found the records as he was directed by our Father in heaven. When you think of all that effort that was given that we might have a knowledge of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, can you wonder, can you wonder that when Joseph Smith, a lad, a teenage lad, went to take those plates from the box that Moroni said, no, not yet. And for at least four more years, he helped to prepare him and teach him before he let those precious records that had lain there 1,400 years into his hands. And then in 1843, on April 6th, Joseph Smith made the statement, if I could back out, I would if I hadn't been called of God, but I cannot back out because I have the truth. Oh, don't ever take it for granted. Don't ever just put it aside and think that it is something you'll do later. Most of you, many of you are returned missionaries, and I'll bet you could recite for me exactly what happened on the day that you received your call. I know exactly what happened in our house on every time there was a call. Oh, you wait for that letter that is yours from a prophet of God. You call the family. You tell them where you're going to serve and what your instructions are. Can you imagine such a scene as having a letter arrive at a home and the missionary picking it up and tossing it onto the table or putting it on a bookshelf or putting it in a drawer and saying, well, I'll read that someday and find out what my instructions are. But we do it with the scriptures. And that's our call. That's our book of instructions. Not long ago, I had the great privilege of visiting with my daughter as she moved into a new home, the home that had been built just for them. And they were putting things away, and as they started to use the new equipment, they found things didn't work just the way they were supposed to. The first day they went to use the oven, it nearly fell out of the wall. And they said, where's that manufacturer's guide? And from it, my son-in-law found out how to secure the oven and the wall, how to connect the power and, and make it useful. And then a little while later, the dishwasher flooded. And they said, where is that, that manufacturer's guide? that book of instructions. 
And we found it again and found that the packing hadn't been taken out of the dishwasher before it was tried to be run. You know, all the time we were doing this, I had the special privilege of putting things away in the laundry room because that is my personal domain. It's my privilege to be there and reign supreme over that room every time I go. I intended to be a cookie grandma, but it's not the way it turned out. My daughter says, Mother, I'll fix the food. You just thread the needle. So as I was putting things away, I said to her, where do you want me to put this little book of instructions on your sewing machine? And she said, very close. Every time something disturbs the tension, we have to read it again and see how to adjust it again. Well, she was expounding wisdom that even she didn't realize. You who have spent Christmas Eves putting slot A into slot B and trying to connect angle D to angle G or something, know how important a user's guide or a manufacturer's guide can be. Would you think that if it's so critical for such things as dishwashers and ovens and vacuum cleaners and sewing machines and toys and houses, little doll houses, that it wouldn't be important for the greatest creation of all? In the Psalms it said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. And that includes you girls too, you know, because it says in Genesis, And so God created them in his own image. Male and female created he them. And he looked upon all that he had made. And it was very good. Oh, yes, you have a manufacturer's guide. He wouldn't send us without a book of instructions. The greatest creation of all, we have in our possession those instructions that can give us all the answers for our day. Oh, appreciate the knowledge that you have that you have available to you. And I say to you, the answers are there. That whatever your problems are, you can find the answer in the manufacturer's guide written by the creator of us all who knows us best and who knows our problems. I heard Elder Paul Dunn challenge the students of Weber State College at one time to make a comparison, a periodic comparison, between their, their scriptures and their textbooks. Now, some of you know that you have to have a new textbook for the same class by the time the next semester comes, because either theory has changed or man's meager knowledge has changed. And Elder Dunn knew wherewith he spoke, because his college chemistry book says, that the atom cannot be split. I know that that is true because my college chemistry book says uranium is a useless metal. We laugh at this point that it had no use at that time. But have the scriptures changed? No, they're constant. They can be counted on. They have weathered the test of time. They have the revealed word of God and the truth for our day or for any day. Now this morning in our Relief Society lesson, the teacher said, do any of you have problems? And, and we all chuckled and laughed. And she said, are there any of you who do not have problems? And she said, if, you, if there are some who have no problems, I really feel sorry for you. Because it's the problems that make us grow. It's part of the plan. It was the reason we came. We voted for it. Not only did we vote for the plan, but we sang for joy. The scriptures tell us in Job. So we feel sorry for you if you don't have some problems. But somewhere we all agreed to come and face the very problems that we're facing today. So what are yours? You're here as students. 
What would you find as an answer? The Lord says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Are you looking for a way to make a living? Of course you are. What does he say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Are you looking for a mate? Of course you are. And you know what he says about that? He says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And if you're making a hard decision, he says, Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Is there a lesson in that for you? Are you tempted? Read the story of Joseph sold into Egypt by his brothers. His father thought he was dead. His mother was dead. A 17-year-old boy, nobody to give him support, no one to see what he was doing. And yet when Potiphar's wife tempted him, he said, How could I do this wickedness and offend my God? Standing firm, standing true. Calamities. Is there hope? Is there help? Oh, how I clung to certain words when our daughter died. How much it meant to me to read, Be still and know that I am God. Or, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Oh, he is a very present help in trouble. Do you feel your own inadequacies sometimes? Oh, I do. And then I think of Timothy, First Timothy, Second Timothy, where Paul is writing to Timothy, whom he claimed as a son, and he said, Stir up the gift of God that is within thee by the laying on of my hands, for God hath not given thee the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Oh, there's great comfort in that for every assignment that comes our way. Do you worry about prayer pressure? Are there those who are trying to convince you to do something you know you shouldn't do? It's getting to be a very difficult thing to decide how not to hurt a friend who invites you over to show a movie on a VRC, or is that the right letters? On a video, <laughs> on a video recorder. And you find it something that you really didn't want to take into your heart and your mind. Well, think of the story of Elisha then. Elisha, whose servant woke in the morning and found that they had been surrounded by all kinds of uh, chariots and horses and armies. And he said, Master, how do we do? And Elisha said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And the poor servant, seeing only the two of them, didn't understand. And so Elisha prayed that his eyes might be opened, and he saw surrounding Elisha hordes of chariots of fire and armies to battle for them. Oh, if you just knew how many people on the other side are cheering for you, if you just knew in a hard moment how many are over there just saying, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you would know that there are so many more with you than with your enemies or those who would lead you astray. Oh, if you would just read. You know, I could go on and on. Do you think your prayers aren't being answered? Read this story of Daniel. Daniel who pled with the Lord and finally he said to him, Daniel, Fear not, from the very first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and chasten thyself, thy words were heard. Your words are heard. All of our words are heard by a loving Father in heaven who wants to help us and will do so if we will but let him. But if we put our letter of instructions in the drawer or over on the table, and don't get into it to find the answers. He can't give us the answers. Now I plead with you that you will take these into your hearts and into your hands and into your heads, that into these wonderful books you will enter to learn and go forth to serve. 
Now, I wish that all were well in Zion and that I could just tell you how wonderful the young people are across the world in the Church. But I picked up in a little airline magazine an article called An Average Day in America. And besides telling you how many hot dogs are sold in the O'Hare airport and how many gallons of mustard go on them, they have some other statistics like this. 5,962 couples will wed, and before the sun sets, 2,986 will divorce. 2,740 teenage girls will get pregnant on an average day in America. Someone is raped every eight minutes, murdered every 27 minutes, robbed every 78 seconds. A car is stolen every 33 seconds, and 3,231 girls will have an abortion on an average day in America. Can you begin to see the need? Oh, how our Father in Heaven is counting on you. There is a great responsibility that goes with the privilege and the blessedness of having received the added knowledge that is ours. Whose responsibility is it? Well, I've told and retold a little story about one of our sons, but I think it illustrates a point, and so I'll tell it to you. Our youngest son has lived all of his life in one house. For the other reasons, outgrowing or moving because of a job, others have lived elsewhere, but he has lived all his life in one house. It isn't a grand mansion but it's been a good home, and he never intends to leave it or live anywhere else. He always expected to go on a mission, but he said, I'll go, and, and uh, then I'll come back. And he went around to the neighbors, and he said, I don't want you to move, and I don't want you to move, and don't you dare let them sell the house. I'm the youngest, and if they move into a condominium, I'll be devastated, and I'll have to come home. We said to him, what if we're called on a mission? You know, that's a very real possibility these days. He thought it over very seriously, and he said, I think we'd better take turns. <laughs> I'll go, and you take care of it, and when I come back, you can go. And we said, well, what if we're still here when you bring a bride home? And he said, I've thought about that. I'm considering remodeling the garage into an apartment for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, his father had had a heart attack, and no one else was home but just Scott. And one day, as things were looking pretty bad, I appealed to this next owner of the property, and I said, you know, we need to do the lawn, we need to do the, the uh, shrubs, we need to do a little painting. And he couldn't have been less interested in anything. I mean, he had important things to do. I think right then he was recording the Beach Boys and fresh air tapes, especially fresh air tapes. He loves them. Well, I thought it was time for one of those reprove with sharpness and then show an excess of love lest they esteem thee to be thine enemy. Uh, someone calls it a woodshed talk, and I dare say each of you has had a few. But I said, you know, if you really do intend to live here the rest of your life, Scott, then you of all people should be concerned about the kind of repair it's kept in, because before you know it, it'll be yours with all its accumulated problems, not ours but yours. And a little minor miracle happened. The shrubs were trimmed. The lawn was not only cut, but cross-cut. I didn't know that it could look like green velvet if you went two directions. But he began to take great interest in calling it the best yard on the block. And it became almost that with his effort. We even got a little painting done. Now, why do I tell you this? Because I think every one of you is in exactly that same position, only it's your world. And young people, you had better see to its repair, because before you know it, with its accumulated problems, it will be yours. And if you intend to spend the rest of your life in it and raise your family in it, then you'd better see to its repair. What would you do? 
What could, where could you begin? I think of the statement of President Kimball, who was speaking to youth some years ago, and he said, Oh, youth of a noble birthright, what a glorious time in which to live. The world is yours. You have been born at this time to have dominion over the earth and all things therein. But there are detours, and you could lose your way. You can grovel in the earth, or you can rise to the skies. It all depends on you, your attitudes and determinations. What kind of a world is it you want? I think you'd better decide, and decide to do something about it, because until you see it as your problem, it's not going to change. Listen to these words of your president, Jeffrey Holland. He says, to me, it seems incongruous that we live today in a society in which a whale or a porpoise or a snail darter or a louse wart, along with any bird or blade of grass in a national park, is entitled to greater legal protection for its life than a five-month-old human fetus. The world will be influenced by what you learn, by what you think, by what you do. You have a great message to carry and a great responsibility to share it with others. My sister Jenny Carlisle is a counselor, a seasoned counselor at Provo High School. Coming into this area, I asked her, what do the young people there need to hear? And she said, I wish we could tell our seniors to accept the responsibility and the consequences of their own actions. Are these just others', others problems that I've talked about in an average day in America? I had two calls last month from Utah County in my office, one of them pleading for help because their Laurel president had just overdosed on drugs and was in the hospital. She said, we have an epidemic down here. What can we do to help them? The other call was that three in their young women program were pregnant out of wedlock. No, they're not just someone else's problems. They're your problems and my problems and everybody's problems that wants to turn the world around. Now, someone has said to President Elaine Cannon, how bad does the world have to get, Sister Cannon, before the Lord will cleanse it again? And she said, but that's not the answer, or not the question. The question is, how good do we have to get? Because we are the Lord's chosen people. We are charged with raising a generation worthy to receive the Savior when he comes. Will you be part of that generation? Will you help? to bring about that great event. As we look to the scriptures, we have the word of he who made us. When he says, hearken, all you nations of the earth, and hear the words of that God who made you. Behold, verily I say unto you that these are the words of the Lord your God. Wherefore labor ye, Labor ye in my vineyard for the last time. For the last time call upon the inhabitants of the earth. For in mine own due time will I come upon the earth in judgment, and my people shall be redeemed and shall reign with me on earth. For the great millennium of which I have spoken by the mouth of my servants shall come. You remember the story of Third Nephi where it did happen for them. Oh, I love the Book of Mormon, and I love those who prepared it for putting a little line on the bottom that you've all discovered that gives us a chronology of the time. It starts out at 600 years before Christ, and then it's 5 and 4 and 3 and 75 and 33, and then Samuel the Lamanite standing on the walls of the city saying, Oh, get ready for the day. It's only five years that the Savior will be here. Put your lives in order and prepare to receive him when he comes. And the five years passed and nothing happened. And so the ruler of the day said, 
all those foolish people who listen to Samuel the Lamanite. If they don't put away that belief, they'll lose their lives on the morrow. And another Nephi, who was their leader at the time, went out and pled with the Lord, cried unto the Lord that they wouldn't be de destroyed for their disobedience or for their obedience. And finally, through his awful pleadings, came the voice of the Savior saying, Lift up your head and be of good cheer, for tomorrow come I into the world. And tonight shall the sign be given. And the sign was that the sun would go down, but the light would remain a day and a night and a day, as bright as day. And when the sign came, many believed and joined and put their lives in order. Then what happened? Thirty-three years later, when the Savior, they knew, of course, by that sign that the Savior had been born to the earth, Thirty-three years later, the world was so wicked that it was cleansed with trials and tribulations that the world had never heard of before. But those who were left, the more righteous, as the scripture says, twenty-five hundred of them, found their way to the temple, heard the voice of the Lord introducing the Savior, and saw him as he descended and came among them. This was no passing vision. This was no dream. He stayed with them for three weeks and taught them. And you have that beautiful story of how he called the children and blessed them one by one. And angels surrounded them with fire, and he said, Behold your little ones. After this event, there was peace on the earth for 200 years because all those who had seen, all those they told, and all those they told, for that many generations believed in Jesus Christ. Then pride again came into the, into the people's hearts. And oh, how many times do we read that pride came in and destroyed the people again? We don't know what the chronology of our time is. No one has marked it down on our calendars as to how long it will be again. But you have to take your cues from a dynamic prophet of God who has told us to lengthen your stride, increase your faith, extend your reach, all these things that he's been telling us to do, and do it, that sign that sits on his desk and somebody said, President Kimball, what is it we need to do? And he said, you all know what it is you need to do. The problem is doing it. He has given us our cues. He is the one that tells us we're in the Saturday night of time. Is there a moment to lose? Is there time to take things for granted? Is there time to let the dust accumulate without reading our instructions, finding out what it is we're supposed to be doing and then doing it? The time is urgent. I plead with you to take it seriously, to accept the responsibility of your own actions and to make a difference in the lives of others. I love the story in the Old Testament of Queen Esther, who had a very difficult thing to do and said that it would cost her life if she went before the king, unbidden. But her cousin Mordecai said, But Esther, who knoweth but that thou art brought to the kingdom for just such a time as this? And if I could call you each by your first name, I'd say Liz and Nikki and Jan and Jane and Betty. Who knoweth? And certainly I wouldn't exclude you men. Who knoweth but thou art brought to the kingdom for just such a time as this? You see, you've already proven that you have all the qualities needed, all those qualities of excellence that are needed to succeed. You've proven that already by being reserved this long to come forth at this time. Don't waste it after waiting so long for your turn. You aren't called to cross the plains. You aren't called to seek the Holy Grail. You are called to stand firm in a world that needs you badly and to stem the tide of sin and error that's in the world today. And those are the words of President Kimball, who said that to us as we were called as a presidency. You are called in this day and age to stem the tide of sin and error in the world today. 
Oh, how much there is to do! How few are the laborers in the vineyard! How we need every single one that's here! As I talk about those things that are happening about us, I want to make one thing <clears throat> very clear to you. If some of those mistakes that are, <clears throat> I've mentioned have been made by you, please do not think for one minute that I'm here to condemn you. One of my other favorite stories is of the Savior who said to the accusers, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And each one went away with their stone unthrown, carrying the weight of their own iniquities. All of us carry the burdens of some mistakes that we have made. But Enos and Alma and Saul, oh, so many of the prophets, have told us about the joys that can come through turning a life around. It is never too late to turn a life around. It is always worth the effort. It is always worth the pain. Let me tell you one little story of a man in Haiti named Alexander Mora. He recorded it for us, so I don't think he would mind us sharing it with you. This man found the little pamphlet of the Joseph Smith story he picked it up and he read it, and he said that he was electrified. He knew that it was true. He can't understand that anyone wouldn't know by reading it that it was true. He had tried everything he knew to find meaning to his life, including voodooism, and nothing had helped. But he knew the truth of that little story. So he wrote to the address on the pamphlet and ask for more information. It was a long time coming, but eventually he received some additional literature and a Book of Mormon. He declares that he never closed his eyes from the time he began to read until he had finished it. Now try that for a challenge. He said he never slept from the time he began at first Nephi till he finished the last of Moroni. He had no need of putting the test of Moroni 10 and 4 to work. He knew from the very first words of 1 Nephi that this was the word of God. So at that point, he climbed on an airplane and went to Florida to ask for baptism with his cigarettes still in his pocket. You see, he hadn't heard that yet. No one had told him about that. And as the mission president explained the word of wisdom and tithing and a lot of other things that become stumbling blocks to some other people, he gently moved the waste basket over to Brother Mora, and Brother Mora dropped the cigarettes in and never smoked again. We asked him if this was difficult, silly question, because this was a man who had smoked four to six packs a day, every day for years and years and years. He averaged about 26 cups of coffee in a day, six or seven before he could get to his store and function, he said. He was a drinker of liquor frequently. We said, was it hard for you? And I say, silly question. He said, the first hundred times I tried. I would get so ill I couldn't go to the store. There wasn't any way I could stop. And I tried and I tried and I'd give it up and go back. But he said, with the help of the Lord, I never had another craving. Now he knows that a miracle happened in his behalf. Just last fall, Elder Thomas S. Monson dedicated the land of Haiti, and with Alexander Mora were 155 members of the Church, all from that small beginning. This land has many branches now, and people who are hearing 
this great voice of gladness, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the hope of the world. It is the great need of the world. And whose responsibility is it to carry it? It is everyone's who has received it. The scripture says it behooveth the man to warn his neighbor. It is our responsibility and ours every one. Now as I think about the people who need to turn their lives around, and I wonder why, and we asked this question as we came into the presidency of young women, why is it that they don't apply the things they learn on Sunday to what they do on Saturday night? Because so often they don't. And we ask groups of bishops, young people, mothers, parents, leaders, and we had some interesting answers. One of them, a group of, of young people from southern Utah was in, and they thought about it, and the very spokesman that you would have chosen, the football hero, the macho man, decided he would be spokesman for the group, and he said, we're going to. We all picture ourselves as good, active members of the church. But we just have to try the ways of the world a little first. Oh, what dangerous words those are. We just have to try the ways of the world a little first. Why are they so dangerous? Because the Spirit withdraws if we aren't doing the things that we are supposed to do. And it is our greatest protection, our greatest help in time of need. And the Spirit withdraws because it can't dwell if we have it in the wrong place and are doing the wrong things. And another thing, who knows when we might run out of time? We don't know that chronicle on the bottom of the page that they did in the Book of Mormon days. And another thing is it's the road to heartbreak. How much better if we could prevent the road to heartbreak, even though there's always hope of turning a life around? It's like the old sage says that we're too late, too soon old, and too late smart. I echo again my daughter's words as she referred them to a sewing machine. I refer them to you with the scriptures. Oh, keep the book of instructions very close. Every time someone disturbs the tension, we have to read and find out how to adjust it again. You can do that. You can adjust the tension in your lives by keeping the books of instructions very close. And if you think that you're worth it, you will keep the commandments. I am quite sure that it's when we don't understand who we are or what we are or how important we are that we make the mistakes that we do. Now, if you need proof of your worth, consider these five things. One, God is our Father. We are His children. We have in us the spark of divinity that comes from a Father that is divine. We are made in His image, is the second one. We are created to be like Him. We, male and female, have been created in the image of divinity. The third one is the preexistence. We did something right. We chose the right way. We're here with a mortal body, and that proves we did something right. I think there's a song in Sound of Music that said we must have done something wonderful to merit what we have. We must have done something wonderful. There was a missionary in Brazil that finally came to a realization of how favored and how blessed he was. And he wrote home and he said, Wow, I must really be something to have been born in this time when the gospel's on the earth, to have been born into my home with my parents and brothers and sisters, to have been called to the best mission in the world, and which one isn't, and to have had my companions, my mission president, my converts to meet these people, wow, I must really be something. 
You are something. Count your blessings. You have done something right to merit all this. That's the third one. The fourth one is the plan of salvation. That wonderful plan that was made for us to become like our Father in heaven. We had come to a point where we couldn't progress any farther. And so this great plan for us to come here and be proven, we will prove them here with to see if they will do all things which the Lord commanded them. This great plan of salvation. I didn't know that everyone didn't know that when I first left home as a youth. I was in Georgia and a girl said to me, well, tell me about the Mormon Church and what it is that you like about it and, and what you believe. And, and I told her those obvious things about the word of wisdom. We don't smoke and we don't drink and we pay our tithing. We go to church on Sunday. She threw her hands in the air and she said, merciful heavens. I want to be religious and hear a good sermon on Sunday, but I'm certainly not going to let it interfere with my life. <laughs> she didn't know the plan of salvation that life is a part of eternity, as much a part as any part before we came or after we leave. It's all one round hole of the plan of salvation. Now the fifth one, if you need to feel your worth, remember that you had an elder brother, Jesus Christ, who died for you. We had Christmas early this year. On October the 23rd, we sat on Shepherd's Hill looking across at Bethlehem where the Savior was born and listening to Elder Marky e. Peterson give that last great address about the life of the Savior. I had a testimony before I went there. It didn't take that to tell me that he lives and loves us. But to walk the ground where he's been and to feel the spirit of the country and the conditions that are there now and that were there then gave us an added appreciation for all that has gone before. Ever since I knew that my mistakes had added to the weight of the Savior's agony in Gethsemane on that night, I have had a wonderful appreciation for what happened there. And to be there, to feel it, and to see it made me love him all the more. He really did die for us. His suffering wasn't so much on the cross as it was in Gethsemane, as he took upon him all those mistakes that you've made and that I've made. And what a tragedy it would be if that sacrifice were in vain. And the only way we can make it valid is by doing all we can, by repenting, by putting our lives in order, by making that sacrifice worth it for him and for us. I know that he lives and loves us. I know that our Father in heaven knows every one of us by our first names. He is not remote. Joseph Smith told us at one time, if we were to see our Father in heaven, we would see him in the form of a man. And later Brigham Young said, if we could see our Father, we would run to him as a, father, as a child runs to his father, and he to us as a father to a child. And we would embrace about the neck, for we love and are loved by him. We have a great line of communication. He has given us that great opportunity to talk with him through prayer. He has sent us with a book of instructions, a manufacturer's guide. He knows us better than anyone. Will you reach into it? Will you put it into your hearts and your hands? Will you go forth to serve? And will you be heir and qualified for all those blessings that he has promised the obedient? I have not seen nor ear heard, nor have even entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those that love him. My only message tonight 
is be among those that love him. Appreciate what is yours. Count your blessings. Take it to others that they too might share this wonderful gospel that is ours. I testify to you that he lives and loves us, that he guides our every action if we will but allow it. The king of love our shepherd is. I thank you for this opportunity. It's wonderful to be with you and see so many youth gathered in one place. You are dear to my heart and have become more so through my experiences of having served with Sister Cannon and Sister Darger in the presidency of young women. And we're thrilled that someone as concerned about youth as Sister Ardeth Cap is the new president. And we rejoice with her in the opportunity that is hers to go forth and see the wonderful youth of the Church and we rejoice for them to have the blessing of her labors and her love. I pledge with you that the Lord will bless you whatever your problems are, if you will allow it, if you will get into the scriptures and make them a daily, a daily habit for you, as we were told in our Relief Society lesson this morning. Whatever your problems are, the answers are there. There is peace there. There is acceptance there. There is comfort there. There is growth there. There is power there. The way to happiness is there. And the way to eternal life is there. May you find them all, I pray earnestly, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.